Hey everyone, welcome back to Peak Human. I'm Brian Sanders. I'm creator of the Food Lies series, which is still going strong. We're looking for an agent now. If you know anyone who's an agent or can connect us, that would be great. Today is a great one with Jason Karp, new friend of mine in Austin. He is an OG, really interesting entrepreneur, had a 22 year health journey. He's on the same mission as Food Lies as me. I went to a presentation he did in Austin and he almost and he basically spit out episode one of Food Lies up there on stage. It was incredible. You got to hear his story. He had incurable blindness that he cured with diet. It's amazing. And now he's on a mission doing big things to change the world, change the way we eat. And he has resources to do so. He co-founded Hugh Chocolate, which you've probably seen in Whole Foods. He now has a majority stake in True Food Kitchen, a restaurant around the country that uses real foods, no seed oils, grass-fed meat, the whole thing. And he has a few other food brands. So he's doing this in a big way, spreading the message. And he's also fighting against Kellogg's. People may have seen the Kellogg's commercial where they're telling people who are struggling to eat cereal for dinner. It's insane. There's a big petition out there. Over 85,000 people have signed. So I'll link to that in the show notes. Let's fight back against the big food companies. And let's also support small food companies like Nose to Tail. This is my business, small business, just supporting some regenerative ranchers, very boutique. We do things well. We pay our ranchers well. We make good products. Find them at nosetotail.org. We have body care products. You definitely want to put beef tallow and no chemicals on your skin. This stuff is the most natural stuff you can get. We have the biltong, the dried meat snacks, and we have meat. They get straight to your door. So go to nosetotail.org, support us. That's one way to take money away from big food. And enjoy this one with Jason Karp. All right, here we go. Jason Karp, how's it going? It's going great. Thanks for having me. Amazing. We're live here in East Austin. I love doing live ones. I don't do them much, but thanks for coming in. Yeah, yeah. My pleasure to be here. <laughs> this is so great because we met at Arena Hall, which is a secret little lunch club. And you gave the most amazing speech. And I felt like you were talking my words. It was crazy. <laughs> and you, I was like, this guy just recited the Food Lies film and it's not even out yet. How, right. how did he know? Right. So you're, you're on the same path. You get it. And let's just hear from you to tell me where you started in all this. Yeah. I mean, first, probably I should give a little background because, um, you know, I think my life and how I got here is a bit of a cautionary tale. And it's also a, a metaphor for, I think, what's happened uh, with the food system and why we're all so sick. Um, you know, I was a, basically a canary in the coal mine, um, and what happened to me in a few years is what's happened to humanity in the last 50. Uh, so basically I've, I, um, I had a um, kind of classic overachiever early life um, where I was just focused on uh, accomplishing as much as I possibly could, you know, went to a great school, did great, was a academic All-American Division One athlete, um, and was just focused on productivity and winning and domination and all of this stuff. What sport, real quick? Uh, I grew up as a tennis player, mm. and I ended up switching to squash in college, and so mm. I played I played squash in college, um, and. In my and then I, I I went to Wharton undergraduate business school, and then coming out of of uh, that I went straight to a hedge fund in 1998 uh, when it was a fledgling industry and and had a very you know coveted job. I grew up middle class, um, and just always uh, at that point just wanted to make a lot of money and be an investor. Um, and in my first couple years of working. Uh, I did extremely well, was made the youngest partner in history at my fund. Um, and on the outside, it looked like everything was going great for me. Uh, and I sort of felt like I was doing everything I had dreamed of, except on the inside, I was starting to fall apart. And I got very sick in my second, uh, it was really about like second and third year of working. Um, I literally started to fall apart. I started to notice that I had all of these skin uh, like psoriasis plaques all over my body. My hair started falling out in, in clumps, like in the shower, mm. I would have like a handful of hair. Um, and, uh, I started developing like terrible brain fog. Um, and then what really, really got me was my vision started to go and I started seeing double. 
Uh, and, and this was at a time where everything at work was going as well as I could think it could go. Uh, and I was obsessed with productivity and, and, uh, productivity hacking where I taught myself how to speed read. I taught myself how to micro nap. This is early days, by the way, this is, you know, 2001 we're talking. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I just kind of was on this trajectory of just more, 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 uh, things that, that made me feel like I was doing, uh, as much as I could, but my health basically said, you know, no mas. And I, when my vision started to go, I went to a bunch of doctors and eventually they discovered that I had a degenerative incurable eye disease where I was going blind at the age of 23. And they told me I'd be fully blind by the age of 30 and that I had to put my name on a corneal transplant list because the progression of my eye disease was so severe that you know, I didn't have a lot of time. And I was uh, just, as, as you can imagine, uh, I always thought I was healthy. I couldn't believe this has happened to me where I was sort of this pinnacle of health two years earlier as an athlete. And now two years later, I'm literally dying and falling apart and no one could figure out what's wrong with me. And I had four or five different diseases that they all thought were separate. They all had recommended different medications or, or things to do. Unfortunately, my eye disease didn't have any, any uh, treatment. And I fell into a really dark depression and I was ashamed of, of what was happening to me because on the surface it looked like I was successful and winning. And on the inside, I was falling apart and I didn't want to admit that, that this was happening to me. And I went down uh, a bunch of rabbit holes uh, of my own research because I had no other choice and I just decided like, I need to see if I can heal myself without modern Western medicine, because that wasn't an option. And I read a lot. I did a lot of my own research. There were some early doctors uh, who uh, pioneered what they now call functional medicine. So these are doctors like Dr. Andrew Weil uh, and Dr. Mark Hyman were two of my inspirations. And I did a lot of reading on the origins of food and the origins of ancestral living, uh, where uh, I did a lot of research on things like what were the early days of the blue zones, uh, which are the regions of the world where they have the highest percentage of centenarians, uh, where people live over a hundred. And I was really fascinated with indigenous communities in particular, where the indigenous communities all over the globe, uh, where some of them are, uh, in the Arctic and some of them are in the jungle and some of them are in, uh, rainforests. All right. Just want to step in for a quick second and tell you about nose to tail.org. This is my small company where we support regenerative ranchers. We do things correctly. We have the best meat you can get sent straight to your door. We have body care made from beef tallow, no chemicals. And we have the biltong, the South African version of jerky with no chemicals, no additives, no sugar. It's great. So check it out at nodesatail.org and keep on enjoying the show. What was so interesting to me when I studied the indigenous peoples and their diets was they all eat very different diets. You know, in the Arctic, they eat blubber and whale and seal meat and certainly no fruits and vegetables in the Arctic mm -hmm. uh, during the winter. And then there were areas like the Maasai, tri the Maasai uh, tribe uh, that, that drinks cow blood um, and, and lives off of, of a, a lot of animal products. And then there's, there's uh, indigenous tribes that live off of fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds. And what was common amongst all these indigenous tribes is they have no chronic disease. They have no obesity. They have no heart disease. They have, um, they have no diabetes. Uh, and then even more interesting, they have no allergies. They have no autism and they have no ADHD. And they certainly have other more acute diseases that they can get like infections and stuff. But despite all these different diets, they all were clear of all of the modern diseases that plague us. And my conclusions from reading all of this was that what they do have in common is that they all eat as close to nature as possible and as close to the earth and what they're, what they're, uh, the way they're living is a way in which we evolved for 200,000 years. And what was so uh, alarming to me and is now very evident. And we can get into some of the stats, which are terrifying uh, mm -hmm. about what's sort of happening with humanity, uh, is that, 
you know, today, if you look at the American public and you look at many other Western uh, or developed countries, we're in what I call a meta crisis. And this is a crisis of multiple variables that are all happening at the same time of physical health crisis. And we'll get in the stats in a second, uh, mental health crisis and a planetary health crisis. And it's all happening all at the same time. And just like my own diseases, where we might think these are unrelated, it, you know, what's happening with the meta crisis is a macrocosm of what is happening to or what happened to me which is that they're all related and they're all interrelated and they're all coming from the same place. And so I decided to go on this very restrictive diet and change my lifestyle as an attempt to cure my diseases. And I, and I wouldn't recommend what I did unless you're really sick because I don't live this way anymore, but I just wanted to see if this did anything. And so, and at the time, you know, I was 23, 24 years old, single guy living in New York City, work hard, play hard mentality. Uh, back at a time when everyone was drinking alcohol all the time and it was lots of caffeine in the morning. It was shitty food throughout the day. It was not exercising. It was alcohol after work, going back to work, you know, working 16, 18 hours a day and probably most unintuitively or interestingly, because I was so obsessed with productivity, I also thought about everything in a pure, uh, quantifiable cost benefit. So I gave up friends and I gave up free time and I gave up enjoyment and I gave up sleep and I gave up exercise because I couldn't quantify how mm -hmm. valuable that was. And I was just focused on how do I do things that make me better? And so I had to do a variety of things. I had, so I cleaned up my diet massively. I gave up alcohol, I gave up caffeine, I gave up processed food, I gave up gluten. Um, I gave up refined sugar for a while. Uh, and I was just trying to see if any of this worked. And then in addition to that, uh, I had to teach myself how to sleep appropriately again. I started exercising again. And I actually was seeing a therapist at the time because I was objectively a bit crazy. Um, you know, I had obsessive compulsive disorder. I was a hoarder of information. So I literally would hoard books and magazines and articles because I was so obsessed with reading everything I could read. And my therapist said to me, uh, you need to focus on doing things that are not for productivity's uh, sake. Um, you need to focus on things that actually give you pleasure and give you joy. And you need to go, you know, watch stupid movies and stupid shows that have no value <laughs> to you. And you need to try, like try to have some fun um, to break the cycle. And over the course of, you know, a few months... I started noticing my skin disease started going away and all my plaques went away. My hair stopped falling out. Uh, and I noticed my vision started coming back. And the doctors thought what was happening when I proposed it to my ophthalmologists, they thought what I was doing was impossible. And they basically said to me in a condescending way, you're never going to cure your eye disease. It's incurable. Uh, and you're certainly not going to be able to do it with food. And... Four or five months later, I went to the doctor's office. I felt like my vision had completely restored itself. And thankfully, there's an objective test. And they gave me the test, mm -hmm. and the disease was gone. And they had never seen that before. And it was so crazy because I remember he called over one of his colleagues, and he said, you got to see this. And I could hear him whispering. He didn't want me to hear. And he, he goes, maybe we misdiagnosed him. And, uh, and then he came up to me, and he said, uh, what did you do? And I told him what I did. Mm -hmm. And he goes, that's impossible. You can't reverse a disease with food. Uh, and and um, he goes, I must have misdiagnosed you. And from that moment on, I had basically, that was one of those days, and we all have them, where you have certain moments and certain days in your life where your life has changed forever. Mm -hmm. That was one of those days for me. And I vowed at that moment that I was going to devote a significant amount of my time, my energy, my resources, my philanthropy, to waking people up and helping others discover that there are a lot of simple things that will allow us to heal. And this is in 2002. Mm -hmm. So this is 22 years ago. And since then, things have gotten so much worse for society, for the, you know, the meta crisis that I, I, I talk about. And um, what's so alarming and, and I, I just want to I want to touch on this for a second from an evolutionary perspective, because that was really my focus was 
what's so alarming is that all of this stuff that we're talking about in terms of the meta crisis, it's really all happened in just 50 years. Mm -hmm. And Homo sapiens have been around. We've been sort of humans for at least 250,000 years. Mm -hmm. And 50 years as a percentage of 250,000 in sort of an evolutionary time scale is a blip. And 99.99% of our humanity, we didn't have all of these modern chronic diseases. And people will say like, oh, well, things are so much better now because, you know, lifespans have gone up. Uh, but what's interesting is that when you look at the quote average lifespan statistics, they have gone up factually speaking, at least through, you know, 10, 15 years ago. But it was because we reduced the acute uh, mm -hmm. problems, things like childbirth, death, things like people dying of infections, dying of acute problems, uh, which science has been amazing for. But we didn't have chronic disease. And chronic disease has become the greatest burden on society uh, that we've ever seen. And so before I kind of get into how I ended up evolving uh, my own career, which led to the start of Hugh Kitchen uh, with my family, uh, best known for our, our chocolate, but Hugh Kitchen started as a restaurant. And the we call it Hugh because our slogans get back to human because we believe that all the modern ailments are related to this. Um, but I just wanted to kind of touch on some stats that are just so crazy because a lot of people sort of think when we talk about this stuff, Brian, people think, oh, Jason's sensationalist. This is like, these are, these are conspiracy theory people. I just want to keep my head down and keep going. And, you know, the speech that you came to, the mm -hmm. subject was wake the fuck up mm -hmm. because so many times it's just very difficult for us with our modern life where we have kids, we have families, we have jobs, uh, we're on the hamster wheel and, and we're asleep. And so in terms of the meta crisis, just some stats. Mm -hmm. So, and this is all in the last 50 or less uh, or fewer years. Mm -hmm. So populations of vertebrates, uh, animals are down, uh, populations are down 69% uh, in 50 years. The number of severe weather-related disasters has tripled since 1980. Uh, causing two and a half trillion dollars of economic damage. Uh, twenty five percent of young adults and teens uh, are have prediabetes or full fledged diabetes, and fifty percent of adults have that. And diabetes, when I was growing up, type two diabetes, uh, when I was growing up, was called adult onset mm -hmm. diabetes because it was only adults that used to get it, and now kids get it. Uh, eight of the ten leading causes of death uh, are lifestyle related, so these are all chronic diseases. Uh, cancer rates are at all-time highs today. Uh, this is going to be the first year in, in history where there's more than 2 million cases of cancer. Uh, and most alarming, which you've seen some of the articles in the last few months, is gastrointestinal cancers of young people have gone fully parabolic. And in all the articles, it was in the New York Times, it was in CNN, all the articles are saying it's mysterious. Uh, I don't think it's mysterious. Um... And then there's the fertility stats where we're literally going extinct. So men's sperm counts are down 50% in 40 years. 26% uh, of women have polycystic ovary syndrome, which is the leading cause of infertility. In the last 10 years, miscarriages are up 10%. Um, the average American visits 28 different types of doctors before they die. 18 prescriptions... Uh, are filled per person per year, and 19% of adult women are on antidepressants. And then probably the most alarming stat, which is sort of outside of what I'll call physical health, are the mental health stats. So suicide rates are at all-time highs. Uh, and this is a stat that most people don't know about, but you could Google it. Loneliness is the greatest predictor of early death. Loneliness, not diet. Uh, in fact, they attribute uh, extreme loneliness, and there was a Yale study that came out about this, that it's equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Uh, so loneliness is more impactful on people than smoking in terms of death rates. And this is all happening right now, and it, it's getting worse by the year. And the thing that's the most alarming to me, and then I'll pause because I've mm -hmm. just I've <laughs> monologued for a while, but you can see that this is really important to me and I think to society— um, what's, what's, uh, most alarming to me is that for the first time in human history, lifespans are falling. 
So this generation is predicted to live a shorter generation uh, than any, uh, predicted to live less long than any other previous generation. And for as long as we've been recording human history, we've been advancing lifespans. And now it's declining. And we are technically the most uh, technologically advanced society that we've ever measured. We exercise more than we ever have. We technically know more than we ever have. And so we're spending more and more money on progress. And if you plotted it in terms of spend, it's going up and up and up and up and up. And we have more medical devices now. We have more procedures than we ever have. We have more prescriptions than we ever have. And things are getting worse. So in any other field of business or anything, if I showed you a chart of spending more money, and not only is it not working, it's actually getting worse. Anyone objective would look at that and go, we're do like we're insane. We're literally insane. Our maps of reality are completely wrong. And we have to stop and we have to start having real conversations about what will work and what can work because what we're doing is we're killing ourselves. You just laid out the sapien thesis. You just laid out the Food Lies film. I still think you must have stolen my hard drive. <laughs> and watch, we even have we have some of these same quotes, ADHD, autism, attention, you know, these things going down. Like we have these quotes, even Dr. Bill Schindler at the end, it says we're we might be living longer, but we're dying longer. Yeah. Right. And yeah. and it's people say that in, in my Instagram post, they're like, Oh, you guys are so dumb with your ancestral ideas. We lived so short back then, or we <clears throat> are living longer than ever. And I'm like, have you been to a nursing home? Have you been to a hospital? We're yeah. not living longer at all. We're propped up in a bed. That means nothing. Yeah. And and look, and, and it's actually factually untrue. Uh, and, and you can even go back to ancient Greek times. But even in like modern, modern, uh, even like, you know, Ben Franklin lived into his late 80s. Uh, we have always had the capacity as humans to live to 100 or longer. But our life was cut short in those earlier times mm -hmm. by things like infection mm -hmm. or things like, you know, moms dying in childbirth. Mm -hmm. So those things have improved dramatically. We have a, we mm -hmm. have dealt with the acute health problems, but the chronic disease problem has never been here until the last 50 years. Yeah, and we show it on screen. So Food Laws, the whole, it turned into a six-part series. The whole idea is to show it visually and show motion graphics and get the best experts to explain it. So instead of listening to this podcast and getting, you know, half of this information stuck in your head, that the everyday person can get it all visually, very simply shown to them. So we're, we're doing a lot of that. And the Sabian thesis, so we, we've come to the same conclusion independently, because I, I didn't know who you were until two weeks ago. <laughs> but we, we have the same thing. So to me, you explained Sapien, which is everything that we're doing we've gone away from nature and that you can't cheat nature. It's kind of the ultimate thesis. And so it's like, we need to couple back to nature. So you're saying we're spending more money. I've, I've posted these same graphs of the spend in the U S is the most for healthcare and all of the disease management and big pharma, big everything. And then yes, our, and out of all the other countries, we're doing the worst and our, our uh, lifespan is going down. Yeah. We now spend more on healthcare per person than we spend on food per person. And, uh, you know, at, at the speech that I gave, there was there was another fun story that I think might be interesting to your uh, listeners, which is another example of you can't cheat nature. And I think uh, 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 and I do believe there's a happy ending. I just want to be mm -hmm. clear, because mm -hmm. a lot of times when we talk about these things and we begin with this, people just think, oh, you know, more doomsday. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear this. I want to have a good day. There is a happy ending if we change things. But here's a great story. In um, 1958, uh, in China, uh, Mao Zedong, known as Chairman Mao, uh, was trying to make, uh, they called it a, like the Great Leap Forward. He had this huge campaign. And he was trying to take uh, farming, which at that point was the big part of, of kind of commerce and, and the fuel of China, and make it more state-controlled and state-owned and more of a kind of industrial effort. And one of the greatest problems that they had observed at the time was that uh, sparrows were eating a lot of the farmers' grain seeds, the seeds. And so Mao came up with this concept of uh, let's kill all the sparrows. They called it the Smash Sparrows campaign. And, of course, you know, you immediately think, oh, what could go wrong? 
And he told everybody in, in the country of China to kill as many sparrows as you possibly could so that we could have more grain seeds. And of course, what they didn't consider about the marvels of nature, and this is a great metaphor of when we have our own hubris uh, thinking that we're basically like gods as humans mm -hmm. and that we can just beat nature. Uh, he decided to tell everyone to kill as many sparrows as you can. And what they missed, of course, is that sparrows eat insects and sparrows eat locusts. And two years later, only two years, they had killed hundreds of millions of sparrows. And there was a massive locust problem that destroyed in, in like an unthinkable amount of plant life. I mean, true devastation. It was the greatest man-made disaster in recorded history to the point where it was so embarrassing for China that books and articles that were written on this at the time have been banned mm. because they didn't want people to know about how bad this was. And so when two years later, when, when all of these things happened, it created an incredible level of famine to the point where 45, they estimate 45 to 75 million people died which was, you know, more than 10% of the population at the time. Uh, and it was all because they were trying to basically interfere with nature using some concept of basic science and not understanding how complex systems work. And it took them a long time to recover from this and realize that nature is something that we can't beat and we have to work with nature. And I thought this was a great metaphor for how we just keep getting into the same problems where we develop these views uh, based on our own research and our own science and just think like, oh, we can use these reductionist materialistic approaches of saying we're smarter than anything and we can through man-made things, we can beat it. And a lot of our problem today in terms of nutrition and the food system is we've used these reductionist methods of saying, oh, we need to do, we need to create things that are as homogenous and refined as possible so that we can make as much of it as possible. And we need to basically fight nature and do the things that our scientists recommend, you know, and this is where a lot of the ultra processing or originally came from. Um, and we could get into, you know, one of the mm -hmm. questions that I think some people ask because my background was as a professional investor, particularly with public companies is how did we get here? If it's always going away from nature is how we got here. And it happened that you can't mess with nature's harmony and the harmonious cycles. And that's the biggest thing I've learned. There's the same story in Hawaii. I'm from Hawaii and we had snakes and then we brought in mongoose. And now, you know, there's this whole problem. Of, it throws off the balance of nature. And I think that's the big problem with monocropping and the industrial farming methods is we're just trying to get more food, but you don't realize that you're going against nature and that we need like soil health yes. to continue to grow. And if we don't, the consequences are unintended and long, right? So we don't know that we're just finally getting the consequences now. Yeah. Same yeah. thing with Beyond Burgers though too. It's like, if you're trying to just hit a macro and we're like, okay, well, we want to make a fake meat that has, if you do it on paper, right? If you're just, yeah. it's like, okay, it does this much protein, this much fat, this much carb, this much these many nutrients and then you think that you're going to get the same result but that's not how nature works you can't just put things into a patty and think it's going to do what a cow did that's evolved for hundreds of millions of years with grasses to create the perfect balance of protein and amino acids and vitamins and minerals for humans yeah look you, you could you could look at it two ways if you're atheistic and you're not spiritual you could look at it from a pure evolution perspective and just say the amount of time and brilliance of evolution is, is, is so incredibly complex that we can't possibly replicate it with our own imagination and our own science, and, and I'll come back to that. Or you could look at it spiritually, which I am, uh, if you believe in God and you believe that there's forces that are bigger than us, that we're literally trying to play God and we're trying to pretend that we can out-God God. Mm -hmm. Um, and that there's, uh, you know, and I'll give you a, a fun mm -hmm. example because I'm, I'm generally, I'm not against, uh, using technology to, and science, by the way, mm -hmm. to improve humanity. I mean, I think I want to be very clear about that. I'm not a Luddite. I think there's incredible things that we have been able to accomplish, uh, in the last 50 years with science and with innovation. But 
when the topic of lab-grown meat came up, where you're literally recreating flesh through cloning and genetically modified organisms, and you're using bioreactors to grow flesh, and people are looking at the amino acid profile, and they're looking at, you know, the ways we can measure it, and they're going, oh, you know, when I do these tests, it's the same thing as the flesh from a cow, because we cloned the cow, and we cloned... Um, uh, the cells, and we're just regrowing it. And I think when you come to applications like like lab-grown leather or lab-grown um, uh, things that are uh, not being ingested mm -hmm. by humans, I'm all for it. Yeah. But when you're starting to put things inside of the human body, the the fun metaphor or example I give to people is if, let's just say, you know, I took you, and let's just say I was a cannibal, okay? Mm -hmm. And you're very fit and you look healthy. Mm -hmm. And I decided I wanted to eat Brian, <laughs> you know? Um, and then at the same time, I cloned Brian. And I went Matrix style and I grew a Brian in a Matrix-like pod with no light, no gravity, no stressors, uh, no real food. And I grew a clone of Brian in that pod. And to, to be the same age as you, there is no way, even if I could measure with, with you know, pick whatever measurement mm. test you use, there is no way that the flesh of that lab-grown Brian in a pod like a Matrix style is the same as this flesh. And you wouldn't want to eat that. Mm -hmm. And that would be the pure scientific view. The spiritual view of it is to believe that all things have a consciousness and all things have some form of a soul. And I believe that when you're eating plants and you're eating animals that have evolved and grown with nature without the abuse, without the hormones, without the antibiotics, without the cages, that that type of food is far healthier for you to consume than the type of food that is made in very severe, strict scientific conditions. This is the ultimate you can't cheat nature. And luckily there's a scientist, Dr. Stefan von Vliet, that I interviewed. And it's coming to Austin. We should hang out with them. Very amazing scientist that studies with metabolomics and mass spectronomy. Yep. The 50,000 secondary compounds. And he thinks there's way more, actually, that are in meat and in foods. And they, they're very different. So he's proving that you can't just grow something in a lab and have the same results. And so if you... Okay, I have a company called Nose to Tail. We do regenerative agriculture. There's hundreds of species of forages and grass that our cows eat over their lifetime. That all gets into their meat, right? Yep. There's 50,000 at least secondary compounds. You cannot get that. It's absolutely impossible yeah. to get that in the thought experiment you said. How would you get that, the, right? Like the real, these nutrients come. And I think for all of history, we got those nutrients. We were eating wild animals that ate their natural diet. And we got all those nutrients. So even if we weren't eating plants, we didn't have the whole food salad bar. We could just eat meat and get all of those nutrients yeah. because they were raised properly. If you have a factory farm, farm cow and they're just eating like some corn and soy and wheat, they're not getting all those secondary compounds. Yeah. And I, look, I think, I think one of the most important things for people to remember is there's a lot of things we still can't measure. And just because we can't measure it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And I think that's the hubris is to think whatever methods we have of measuring using mass spectrometry even, mm -hmm. we're measuring things that we can conceive of. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of things that science still can't explain. And I want to be very clear, like we are at the pinnacle of where we are in our own human evolution in terms of technology. But it doesn't mean that science can explain everything. We still can't explain how the placebo effect even works. Mm -hmm. And the placebo effect is used in every single randomized controlled drug trial because our ability to heal ourselves with our mind, we know it works. We just can't explain it. We still can't fully explain the origins of life. We still can't explain the origins of consciousness. We can't find a place in our brain that explains where consciousness comes from. The Big Bang theory has been changed at least five, six times in the last 20 years in terms of when it actually started and how it actually works. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important for us to have humility and acknowledge that there are a ton of things that we can't explain and there are a ton of things that we can't measure. 
And to presume, and, and the, the simplest example, which we've known for 50 years, is that eating a whole orange, for example, is not the same as taking mass spectrometry, pulling all the pieces out of the orange and saying, oh, it's made up of these pieces. It's made up of vitamin C. So let's just give people vitamin C. There are a lot of things using a reductionist, materialistic approach that we can't replicate. Mm -hmm. And we just have to have humility and go, oh, we know a lot. And I think for a lot of things, we can do it. But there's a lot of things we still can't explain. And we have to be cognizant of that. It's so true. So this is what I'm, I'm trying to get the, the master theory or thesis of this. And it's you can't cheat nature in the fundamentals of being human, but you can cheat nature, quote, cheat it using leverage. So this is an airplane. I call airplanes and iPads. Like we, we, quote, cheat nature with airplanes and iPads. We can do a lot. But it's not saying, like you said, ingesting it, right? You, you, we can use it for leather. We can use the fake meat for leather because we're not ingesting it. If we're ingesting it, you cannot cheat nature in those fundamental things of being human, which are food, movement, sun, community, sleep. Yeah. Like, you so can't you can't cheat. You certainly can't cheat, the, cheat those, especially so sleep. You, yeah. So you learn that the hard way. But even, okay, say in five years, they're like, oh, we gave you this pill and you can sleep three hours, but it's like you slept eight hours. It is yeah. not. You cannot cheat that. You can't just take some pill and three hours equals eight hours. You need the eight hours. Movement. You can't build a machine that works out for you. That's the stupidest. Like, you have to do the work. That's the yeah. whole point of working out. Yeah. Food. Like you're talking about, like Soylent. Soylent tried to, get, you know, that drink. They tried to put all the chemicals and uh, fake vitamins and minerals into the same ratios that we thought that, you know, we needed. Didn't work. Doesn't work. I would never drink that. Uh, so food doesn't work. Sun, you can't just get like in a tanning bed you, in, in your thought experiment. If you're in a pod and you just have some fake light, that's not going to give us all the spectrum of light from the sun that we need. That's right. And, that's so, and in the community too. And you brought up the blue zones, right? There's all this community that we need. We need true community, like the loneliness, the biggest cause of suicide. Yes. Right? That's because we have, we've cheated nature in society with our community. We don't have the real relationships that we used to have. Yeah. that Look, I, I, I would say that, that while this is probably a nutrition-focused uh, podcast, and certainly my platform with both Hugh Kitchen and, and my uh, second business, which is the culmination of my life's work, HumanCo, um, while that tends to be nutrition-focused in terms of how people perceive it, the community, social, spiritual part of human life is unquantifiably important. And you see it from all of these things um, where laughter heals and community heals. And the, the common thread of the blue zones and the common thread of all the indigenous communities that have all of these uh, thriving aspects to them is that we are social creatures and we need each other and we need love. And some of these things sound like woo and they sound touchy-feely because we can't quantify things like love and laughter and happiness. You know, those are all subjective things. Mm -hmm. But you can see it everywhere. Like nobody would dispute when they see, you know, and the easiest example is Europe, which is a developed area. You know, countries like France and Italy, which have numerous nutritional paradoxes. Uh, you know, they eat bread, they eat butter, they... Uh, saturated fat, yeah. They eat a lot of saturated fat. They exercise much less than we do, but they spend a lot more time together and they respect nature much more and they respect the brilliance of nature and they they uh, revere farming and they revere agriculture and they re revere how we came here. And while they may not be as, quote, wealthy as we are, they live longer than we do. They're much happier than we are. And then it makes you ask the question, like, what are we optimizing for? Are we optimizing for, like, who's the richest person in the graveyard? Or are we optimizing for, like, how do we be fulfilled and how do we be happy and how do we actually enjoy our life and realize, like, what are we on this planet for? And I believe that we are on this planet to make everybody better and to make and to leave this world a better place than when we found it. And I think the last 30, 40 years is that we've gotten so good at science and technology, and we've gotten so much into our intellectual brains that we've moved away from all the things that, that make us human that are less quantifiable. 
And it's literally what happened to me when I was 23, which is I just went as deep as I could into productivity and my brain, and I'm going to beat everything with my brain and my intelligence. And I forgot that your heart is also a valuable organ that does a lot more than just pump blood. And it's where instinct comes from. It's where emotion comes from. And I think the more that we get back into leading with our hearts and recognizing that there's a lot more to life than just domination and making a lot of money and making lots of shit, I think we're all going to heal. It, we can start to quantify this because the number of people on the SSRIs and the different medications, the people that are committing suicide because of loneliness, this is something that we can now quantify. Yeah, it and, gets worse every year. And you know what's great is, is the back to human. I, I independently came up with that. Well, I don't know. Maybe I saw it on your chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we were, you know, this is what we're doing at Sapien is going back to human. So everything and you're talking about. And that's why you chose the name Sapien. Yeah. Well, that is the ultimate one. Right? That, that was like seven years ago, actually. Yeah, yeah. So it's, that is the, the meaning of life or how does someone thrive and succeed and be happy? It is being closer to our human roots, right? Anything that you say that you, when it's basically you went away from being human, doing focusing on productivity instead of focusing on relationships is going away from nature, away from yeah. being human. It's like, what did we do for 99.9% .9 of human history is we were with small bands of people. We were around a fire. We were connected to each other. We were eating real food. We're doing all these things and that's how we are happy. And so we don't have to go back and live in a cave. No, but we, we just need to align to nature more and you can still do that in society. That's yeah. a big thing, too. I don't want to be like, we're going to be anarchists. Correct. We're going to leave. And we don't have to all go like do Burning Man and yeah. live in camps and become, you know, kumbaya hippies. Like, I want to mm. be very clear that when we talk about these things, a lot of people are like, wait a minute, I'm not going to do that. I still want to be able to have a job, have a family, you know, live a regular, regular life. And what I tell people is, of course you can. We don't have to go back to hunter-gatherer ways, but we have to remember what we have forgotten. And we have to be objective. When we look in the mirror, we have to say what we're doing today is not only not working, it's actually going the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And people just have to go, okay, let's pause. Let's recognize that we're all getting sicker every single year. And we have to, we have to start to parse out what are things like flying on an airplane that have been incredible advancements? And what are things like eating ultra processed food and using reductionist, me reductionist methods um, to figure out and formulate what we're supposed to eat and sitting at our desk for 15 hours a day and not getting sunlight and not moving around and not spending time with loved ones. Those are things where if we just tweak the ratio, even a couple hours a day, where we spend a little bit more time outside, we spend a little bit more time walking around and moving, we spend a little bit more time with our loved ones, we spend a little bit more time focused on cultivating relationships. And by the way, you know, as I told you in the beginning of my story, I was terrible at this. You know, like this is something I had to learn the hard way. Um, I was a machine. Like I literally became a cyborg. Mm -hmm. and, and from a pure output perspective, my output was extraordinary to the point where people would look at me and be like, how does Jason do so much? But I was dying. And so we have to come up with a better balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and to close off my kind of cheating nature and the difference, the, the difference is in the most human ways you can't cheat nature. But it's like, so the difference is aligning with nature or leveraging l nature. So I think that the airplane example or the iPad is that you're still leveraging nature, but you're not going against it. You're, yeah. all, you're, you're doing something to help you get a mechanical advantage, like a bicycle is a mechanical advantage from walking. So that's that. But that doesn't go against the human pillars. Yeah. Right. Like it's not like, yeah, it, that changes the way you eat or move or it, it doesn't go against it at all. And and let me just look, give your listeners or, or, mm -hmm. or, or people a little bit of rays of hope mm -hmm. because. We, we do have a lot of our modern conveniences and our modern things that we love. And I'm one of those mm -hmm. people. And this is why, uh, this is the, the beginnings of this were why my family and I created Hugh Kitchen. And the bigger picture is why I've created a human co. And I'll, I'll get into mm -hmm. a little bit of, of, of what that is. But when I was sick and I had to give up all the things, all the foods that I loved, mm -hmm. that was the hardest part. 
because you get used to eating things that are amazing and delicious, things like chocolate, things like bread, things like cookies, things like pizza. And the first question that people ask is, are you telling me I have to go back and just eat salads and meat all day and I can't have all of these like delicious comfort foods? Um, because we also have to recognize that we are here and we're not going to change habits overnight or in weeks or in months. And everyone is addicted to foods that are really delicious. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, uh, the origins of Hue, which was a restaurant, was we can create amazing foods that are comfort foods, uh, but are made with far less processed ingredients that are made with wild animals instead of caged uh, laboratory or, or, you know, abused antibiotic growth hormone kind of animals. Um, we can create dishes with organic fruits and vegetables. We can create cookies instead of using ultra refined, genetically modified sugar and ultra refined bleached flour. You can make cookies with unrefined, uh, grain free, gluten free flours that are organic. Um, and that was the origin of, of Hue Chocolate, mm -hmm. was it that, that cacao is a health food. Uh, and instead of using genetically modified uh, white ultra-refined sugar, we used unrefined organic coconut sugar, which is the basically the distilled sap of the palm tree. And so you still can have sweeteners and you can still have these things without um, going to tr like pure – uh, either carnivore or pure, like, vegan diets. And then this extends to more products. This extends to Beyond Chocolate. The original idea behind Humanco, uh, Humanco, just for background, is uh, we are a holding company, or think of us as a mini conglomerate or an ecosystem, where we're trying to buy and build brands uh, that allow people to live a healthier life but doing it in a way where we're creating fun, epic, enjoyable products and experiences that still allow us to enjoy the things we want to enjoy without having all the processed garbage and junk. And my belief, and I spent a lot of time in the nutrition uh, area. I was on the board of one of the top nutrition schools. I've spent a lot of time in uh, Washington, D.C. policy work. We've known for 70 years that Twinkies – are a lot less healthy than fruits and vegetables. And yet our habits haven't changed at all. And the food pyramid was a colossal disaster. Um, but the reason we're here and why Hostess sold for five and a half billion dollars recently mm. is because we're addicted to these kinds of foods. And instead of saying to Americans, like, just don't eat any of it, it's not gonna do anything. So instead, let's work with the system, let's meet people where they are, and let's create much better versions of these things that are kind of like a gateway drug to getting people to more natural forms of eating without them feeling like they have to make these extreme sacrifices. And so one of the – so we have, uh, we have three brands under Human Co. that are all in areas that we call foods that bring people joy because I wanted to focus on areas where people actually love eating these things – because that's where I feel like you're going to make the most amount of impact. Um, we have a gluten and grain-free, uh, seed oil-free. Everything we do is gluten-free, grain-free, seed oil-free, um, and all simple ingredients. Uh, so no preservatives, no chemicals, certainly no techno food. Uh, everything's as close to kind of nature and the farm as we can be. So we have a gluten and grain-free bread company called Against the Grain. We have a organic, um, a sustainable... Uh, ice cream company uh, called Cosmic Bliss, uh, and we have an organic, gluten-free, grain-free uh, pizza bite company mm -hmm. because I I grew up on a lot of mm -hmm. pizza and things like Totino's pizza rolls, which are made of literally like toxic waste, uh, <laughs> called Snow Days. And then we have um, uh, we have strategic investments where we have a lot of of control and involvement, but we don't own them entirely uh, in a handful of brands. Uh, our biggest one is called True Food Kitchen. True mm -hmm. Food Kitchen is, a, is the largest uh, health and wellness full-service restaurant in the country. Uh, there's 45 tr True Food Kitchens in 17 states. And if you go to True Food Kitchen, uh, you'll see that it's an approachable, 
farm to table uh, restaurant where, and it's also the, it's the only full service national restaurant group that doesn't cook with seed oils. Mm. Um, and look, we're always trying to upgrade everything we do, but we're trying to be pragmatic. And I think what I would tell people is, is you don't have to go like full, full strict paleo. There's a lot of changes that people can make. And probably the most important changes that people can make is around leaning into more natural, organic, and regenerative farming methods where you're healing the soil, you're healing the plants, you're healing animals. And what a lot of people don't know about regenerative farming methods is that healthy soil sinks more carbon from the atmosphere than anything else we know of, more than making electric cars. If we could get the soil in very, very large quantities to actually be vibrant and healthy, we will sink more carbon than anything else that we can do. And at the same time, when you do that through regenerative farming methods, where you create an ecosystem where the plants and the animals and nature are all working in the way that we've evolved with, everything heals itself. The food is better for everybody. The animals are healthier. The atmosphere is healthier. And I believe that the whole meta crisis will begin to reverse when we get back to nature. But that's the only solution. I, I don't know what else. What people, it is. I don't know. They have some ideas that we're going to invent some like fake thing that will, will fix this problem because it's not. You have to go back to nature. And yeah, I, I am, I'm with you on the, you have to meet people where they're at in their journey. And, you know, yeah, 85% of my diet is complete, like single ingredient foods, right? But then there are things like I just had some raw milk with uh, matcha Amazing. and some maple syrup. You know, it's like, it's like you, you want something delicious. You want something that's a, like a little bit, quote, refined, like a maple syrup in a package. It's organic, but I mean, I don't know. It's packaged. It's yeah, got sure. to me. Right, so it's like you humans want that. I get what you're saying, so I, I do appreciate your mission of of bringing that to people on a mass scale. Yeah. And I think processing gets a bad rap. And I think you know, in the last six to nine months, there's been all these articles about ultra processed food being the source of all ills in humanity. And I think it's very important to define, which they haven't really defined well, what ultra processed oh, yeah. means. And because I think people think like, oh, that means we can't process anything. I mean, butchering a cow is a form of processing, to be clear. Yeah. Um, you know, distilling uh, maple syrup out of a tree is a form of processing. So, of course, we're going to process things. I well, think we're humans. That's our whole thing. That's our Homo whole sapiens. So, we're smart. <laughs> right. But I think ultra processing is when we take a whole food and we, we iterate it so many times that we strip it of all aspects of organic material, and I don't mean organic as a classification of not using pesticides and mm -hmm. being non-GMO. I mean organic from like a, from a chemistry perspective mm -hmm. that everything in nature is, quote, organic. Um, but when you take something, even like wheat, um, and you process it to the point where it becomes bleached white powder of flour, and this is something that I've shown my kids. If you take ultra refined bleached white flour and you put it on the ground next to a bunch of insects, they won't eat mm -hmm. it. And it's a very simple test. If insects won't eat it and it doesn't rot, it's not food. Mm -hmm. And most of the modern food that we have doesn't pass that test. And that's, that's the definition of ultra processing. It's not taking maple syrup from a tree <laughs> and turning it into maple syrup that we can eat. That's fine, you know, and it's not even taking, you know, uh, grass fed meat and turning it into a burger patty. That's processing, but it's still fine. Yeah, I, I characterize it as industrially processed or traditionally processed. Yes. So everything traditional, making yogurt, all, all the things yeah. you just mentioned. Cheese. Because, cheese. This Raw is, milk. Yeah. Like yeah. making a sausage. We've made making sausages for forever. I don't know when the first sausage was made. Th thousands and thousands of years yeah and people well i mean i don't want to add nitrates and a bunch of Correct. weird stuff to it yes like if you make sausage make it the natural way with salt yeah yeah and yeah. these are fine and then so i don't know why people can't understand i don't know maybe we're just nutrition nerds and we think about it too much because it's very easy for me to know the difference between industrially processed and traditionally processed and the easiest way to think about it is the industrially processed it loses nutrient density 
traditionally it actually increases nutrient density, right? Turning milk into kefir, it actually Correct. increases or making sauerkraut, it increases the bioavailability of the nutrients. Yeah. And the other thing I'd, I'd say on the processing, which is important, and let's use industrial mm. seed oils as an example, is um, industrially processing does two things. One is by subtraction and one is by addition that are mm. both bad. So the by subtraction in the example of the uh, highly refined white bleached wheat flour is it removes the fiber, the nutrients, it removes all of the all the micronutrients mm -hmm. that are in it. Um, so that's the removal. So it, you're turning mm -hmm. uh, a, a food into a not food. But in the case of, because a lot of times people ask like, why are seed oils so bad? And what I point out is they're not in and of themselves so bad. If you had an organic sunflower seed, and I don't want to get into the to the debate about the the fat ratios of omega threes to omega sixes mm -hmm. to omega nines because I think that's actually debatable. Mm -hmm. I just want to get into the debate about what goes into making industrially processed seed oils. So if you had organic sunflowers and you took the seeds and you cold pressed them in your kitchen and you made some seed oil in your kitchen with no additives and no nothing, it's probably okay. Yeah. And there's another debate about whether we should be consuming lots of oils. Mm -hmm. That's another debate. We don't have to get into that. Mm -hmm. But when you look at how industrial seed oils are made, like canola oil, they have to, so the seeds are typically rancid and they have to bleach them because of the color. They have to deodorize them. They have to extract them with petroleum derivatives and they typically use hexane or butane. Uh, and in many cases, they're not, they're GMO, they're not organic. So the pesticides and all the crap that went into those seeds being even, even made or, or grown, there's residue of that. There's residue of the extracting agents of, of, of the petroleum derivatives and you're bleaching them and you're deodorizing them. And if you look at all the steps that go into that, uh, not only are you removing all of the original nutrient density of however it, it, it was, but there's all these added chemicals that you can measure in mass spectrometry. And they've done this with a lot of the modern food supply where they detect massive amounts of glyphosate, massive amounts of petroleum derivatives that are getting concentrated. Because when you take something that is a concentrate, right, whether it's coffee beans or like one of the things that people ask me often is, when should I be really focused on organic? And I say, well, whenever it's a concentrate of something, mm. so like a juice is a concentrate of something, uh, coffee is a concentrate where you're taking the beans, you're grinding them, and then you're mm. running water through that, creating a concentrated version. If something is filled with chemicals and pesticides, you're concentrating that too. Mm. And I think that's a really important thing to remember about why are seed oils bad? Just look at how they're made. Like, would you want to consume motor oil? And most people would go, no, I don't want to consume them. And I think a lot of our modern ailments are because of the industrial processing of what's both removed and also what's added. That's it. That's it. And we, you talk about how we got here and we should zoom out to the food process, food industry, because people think that it's just that they add fake flavors and it makes them addicting. Right. But I think there's, it's way more to it. It's that they have, their incentives are so misaligned that the more nutrient less they make a food, the more we'll eat it, right? Because these nutrient devoid foods that they make, they have an incentive for us to eat more, right? They're shareholders, they want to sell more food. So I actually figured out more recently that it's not just about adding fake flavors to Doritos and you just, you're addicted to them and you want to eat more of them. That's part of it. But it's actually, they're tr they can try to make things with as few nutrients as possible, bleaching flour, seed oils. This stuff has so little nutrition that your body eats it and just wants more. That's right. Right? And That's it's a it's big not part of it. Your body is incredibly intelligent in knowing if it's not getting the nutrient density that it needs. So if you give your body something that's very high calorie with low nutrient density, it's going to want to keep eating it to get more nutrients. And but they're not there. The, that's the whole industry, the food industry. And then, so I'll ask you, because I'm trying to do this too. You're trying to do this is let's do stuff for the masses but make it actually good for you or better for you. And so how do you do that? Because it's hard with the, with the profit margins. I guess if there's a way to do it where you don't have to sacrifice the quality of your ingredients. 
This is the this is the big big question, and this is what I have spent the better part of you know fourteen fifteen years of my life thinking about and devoting uh, to, uh, which is part of the reason you don't see more nutrient dense healthier foods in a grocery store is because it costs a lot more to do it right. Mm. And we in this country, and this is not the case in Europe, in uh, today, uh, by my last uh, looking at the estimates, we spend about 9% of our paychecks on food. And places uh, like France and Italy spend over 20% of their paychecks on food. That's normalized for the paycheck. So it doesn't matter what uh, what your economic level is. Americans used to spend more too. 40, year, 40 years ago, we spent about 20. Mm, we yeah, spent yeah. about the same percentage of our paycheck on food 40 years ago as France and Italy. And today we spend less than half. Back when we were healthier. Yeah. We were way healthier. Mm-hmm. And something happened in this country, which I think is, is attributable to certain capitalistic... Uh, public market views of this concept of everyday low price in places like Walmart. And again, and we could get into a whole nother discussion about um, uh, the true cost of food. And and I believe there is a, a, a terrible misperception, uh, which we can show, by the way, with data. There's a terrible misperception that you have to be wealthy to eat mm. healthy. And what it is, however, in this country is that we have, for the last 30, 40 years, there has been this, this focus on getting food to be as cheap as possible and making it a virtue that food should be, quote, affordable for everybody. And of course, that's a true statement. Of course, everybody should be able to afford food. However, when you look at even the lowest socioeconomic demographics, um, and there's been a lot of research on this, and we've looked into this, so the, the first place you want to do a cutoff is, is people who can afford a smartphone. So if you have a smartphone, which is 93% of this country has a smartphone, if you can afford a smartphone, then this is a valid discussion. If you can't afford a smartphone and you're in true abject poverty, mm-hmm. it's a different discussion. Yeah, yeah. Then, you, then there's caloric deficiencies and there's real, real different issues of how to help humanity in that level. But if you can afford a smartphone, and then you look at uh, how even the lowest socioeconomic demographic spends money in uh, for those who can afford a smartphone, where does some of their excess, and they do have a little bit of excess discretionary income, where does some of it go? And it's, it's alcohol, it's cigarettes, it's soda, it's things like streaming services, so things like Netflix and Spotify. And you'd be surprised also that it's things like a pair of Nikes or a pair of Adidas or it's things like a Frappuccino at Starbucks. And, and so it's not so much of people can't afford better food. It's much more of where is their other income going? And so we have to change the conversation to say, don't buy the Starbucks. You don't need that extra streaming service. And and it turns out for two to three dollars a day, that's all it is. Two to three dollars a day, you can massively upgrade people's uh ability to buy healthier food. Uh and there's also things like, you know, people need to be cooking more, and you then you get into conversations about convenience and who has the time. But a lot of it is, is changing the conversation. So when you get into grocery stores, the grocers, and I have been dealing with consumer packaged goods for a long time now, the grocers want to have the cheapest possible food on their shelf because they're all competing with each other. Mm-hmm. And they want to say like, oh, we have $5 ice cream. Or they want to say that, you know, or in the case of fast food, we have a $3 cheeseburger. And the better question is, how do you make a $3 <laughs> cheeseburger? That shouldn't even exist. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't even be possible. You know, the fact that for like over a decade, a fruit cup at McDonald's was more expensive than their cheeseburger. Like, just think about that for a second. A bun, a patty, cheese, all the sauces, all the crap. Putting that all together is somehow cheaper than a cup of fruit. And then you get into, you know, the subsidies, you get into the mass production issues. And so I think part of the problem is, is that we and and Europe figured this out where in France and Italy, they have disdain 
for ultra cheap food. They won't even eat it. Mm -hmm. And so how do we change the conversation to say the best investment we can make in humanity is to pay a little bit more for better ingredients, better practices, better treatment of animals, better treatment of people and and the, the people who work in all these places so that we end up voting with our wallets. Because if people refuse to buy the $3 cheeseburger, that industry would go away, mm -hmm. like overnight. And that's what I think we have to do is we have to get people to start taking honor uh, in buying better things. And what what's amazing to me is that in all consumer categories that are not food, people like to pay up for premium and quality. You know, mm. even, in, you know, especially when it comes to vanity. Oh, for a car, for like your brands of clothing. For a car, for brands of clothing, for shampoo, for makeup, mm. for, you know, in all aspects of vanity, people like to pay up for better stuff. Yeah. Um, but for some reason, there's this cool factor in buying the cheapest possible food. And we have to change the conversation. That's an interesting one, that it's only food. And yeah, in, in Europe, they they look down on it. And actually, I, I was with the Maasai. I was drinking the blood and the milk, actually. And Clemens, he was the elder. He in, intuitively, I guess it's very easy if you have your body's intuition because he just lives with nature. He doesn't trust foods on a shelf. Yeah. He's like, I won't eat that. He's like, and he was giving this whole spiel about the Maasai are getting sick because they're eating foods from the shelf. They're eating the seed oils. He just knew seed oils are bad. Of course. Like you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that seed oils are bad. He's like, I don't like the oil in the, in the jugs in the store. I don't want the foods that can sit there for too long. I don't trust that. Yeah, he's right. And look, I, I just want to also say that this is for, for Americans who are suffering from all of these chronic disease problems. It's not their fault. This system has been rigged against us for so long. And through the advertising, through the big public companies, uh, through the messaging, through the focus on profits only mm -hmm. and ignoring all the downstream externalities of we're just going to try to make as much money as we possibly can and ignore what happens to people and ignore what happens to the planet. Because it's, if I'm a public company, that's not my problem. My problem is I got to deliver profits to my shareholders. And if I don't deliver profits to my shareholders, I get fired. And so the whole system is rigged against people and it's not their fault. Mm. And once they become aware of, and they wake up to how toxic and corrupt the system is, then if they keep choosing it, then it's their fault. <laughs> it's their fault. But most people don't know. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll give you the example of, of, you know, two weeks ago we filed uh, a letter and we filed a, a, a legal activist letter against Kellogg's. Um, and you can go find this on the internet. Just search my name or my handle on uh, my various social medias at human carp, K A R P. Uh, and you could see our post against Kellogg's Kellogg's, um, is known for its U S uh, global cereal, uh, best known for things like fruit loops and frosted flakes. Kellogg's came out, um, with this cereal for dinner campaign. Mm -hmm. And they had this, they had a, a television commercial, which I would tell you guys to Google if you haven't watched it. It, it looks, looks like, fake. It looks like a Saturday Night Live sketch. It's yeah. so ridiculous. Where Tony the Tiger comes into a family's <laughs> dinner scene and says, you should, eat, you should eat cereal for dinner and give chicken the night off. And this was like the last straw for me of big food trying to do whatever it can to get us to not get off the hamster wheel. And one of the things that most people don't know is that uh, there are a lot of ingredients in the food system and there's hundreds of these ingredients in the in general consumption, like things of cosmetics and personal care. Hundreds of ingredients are banned uh, in Europe that are allowed in this country because we have much looser regulations. We have corrupt lobbyists who want to make more money and uh, Fruit Loops, which is the one that I pointed out, but they have a bunch of cereals that do this have a inferior, less safe version of Fruit Loops in this country, in the U.S., mm -hmm. than they do in Canada, than they do in the EU, and then they do in U.K. and Australia. And particularly artificial food dyes, which are petroleum-derived and are known to cause severe behavioral issues in children. Some of them are known to be carcinogenic. There's a few preservatives that they use, like BHT, that are banned in other countries. 
Many of these artificial food dyes like Red 40, Yellow 5, Yellow 6, Blue 1 require a warning label like cigarettes do in all these other countries that says on the package, you can Google this, it says on the package, the ingredients in this food may lead to severe behavioral disorders and learning disorders in children. And Kellogg's makes a Fruit Loops in this country that has those Red 40, Yellow 5, Yellow 6, Blue 1, BHT. They make one here that has that. And in Canada, it's natural fruit-derived food colorings and no BHT. And they make it in this country. They already make it. They already have the formulation. And so they're sending a safer version up to Canada, and they're giving American children the more toxic version here. So we sent them a letter that said, in 2015, you had made a, a pledge to this country that you were going to get rid of artificial food dyes by 2018. To much media acclaim, it was in every newspaper. They had all these headlines that made them look like they were doing the right thing. I'm sure it helped their sales. And then they quietly ignored their pledge. It used to be on their website. They took it off their website. They hoped nobody would notice. And they keep making new cereals. And uh, Vani Hari, known as the Food Babe, who's a dear friend, and she's been a food activist for a long time, she came out in like 2019, and this is when uh, Kellogg's created a new cereal called Baby Shark, based on the popular Baby Shark song, that's targeted at toddlers. And it has all this shit in it. And so we wrote a letter that said, enough's enough. You made this pledge. You didn't adhere to it. You're poisoning American children. You're giving Americans an inferior, less safe version than you're selling abroad. Americans deserve the safest version of a cereal you already make. And I'm not even talking about the fact that kids shouldn't eat sugar cereal, <laughs> yeah. which is another issue. No. But talking about meeting people where they are. I'm saying Kellogg sells $2.7 billion a year of cereal in this country. That's a lot of cereal, which means people like their cereal. So, yes, I would love to campaign to get people to stop eating cereal completely. But step one is get this fake artificial processed crap out of the cereal. And Kellogg agreed to meet with us. Mm. And so we haven't met with them yet, but we've gotten 77, 78,000 signatures on this petition if you go to our social media, you'll see that there's a link somewhere in there to sign the petition to tell Kellogg's that they have to stop this shit and we have to hold them accountable. And the two ways to hold them accountable are legal action and voting with your wallet. And if everybody boycotts Kellogg until they change this, they will change it overnight. Mm -hmm. Just like what happened with Bud Light, which is a whole different issue and I don't <laughs> want to talk about the politics yeah, yeah, of that. Yeah. But if sales of a, of a public company drop by 5%, because of a stupid thing that they did, they will change their practices respond. overnight. They respond. And yeah, I'll, I'll link to it. We'll post about it. I'll, I can do a post with you or something about this petition. We could sign that. And so this is all over them making a few more cents per box because it's, it's a cheaper formula. There's two reasons that they do it. Um, they probably make a few pennies more a box by using artificial food dyes are undoubtedly cheaper than natural food coloring. Yeah. And then the other issue, which... I don't think they'll publicly admit because it sounds so absurdly damning is uh, kids respond better to brighter colors and artificial food dyes have brighter, more vibrant colors, which are fake. Mm. And so they are worried that if it's not as bright and other companies still have the brighter Fruit Loops version, that it'll affect their sales. And I believe that if Kellogg's steps up, and, and I want to be clear, like I'm not trying to crucify them and I'm not trying mm. to bury them. I believe that if Kellogg shows that they can be responsible, that the public will respond positively and that their sales might actually go up by behaving responsibly. Mm. So they actually can win. And my dream is that if they do it, their stock goes up mm. because if their stock goes up and sales go up when they start behaving more responsibly – other companies will follow suit, and that's the fastest way to clean up this food system is by showing companies that if they behave more responsibly, people will buy more of their products. And that's a virtuous cycle that's positive that would be amazing. That's a good message. I love that. We should end here. I want to go back just real quick because it was such an amazing story that we kind of just passed over is you getting your site back. 
<laughs> you getting your site back is incredible. I hope people, you know, take this to heart, realize that so much can be done with diet and lifestyle. And I've heard equally incredible stories around the world because I've just been in this world for 10 There's years. There's thousands now. of these stories like me. Yeah. Thousands of these stories. I mean, I, I am literally in a scientific way, a miracle. I am a miracle. I cured mm. something that they didn't think was curable. Um, and there are thousands, tens of thousands of these mm. stories of people having scientific miracles, which aren't really miracles. They're basically just our bodies have incredible ways of healing itself if you remove the poisons. And it's the same thing with nature. The miracle is a human body that yeah. we have this ability and people have just lost their way. And I think big commerce and all the big structures in society want you to lose that way That's because right. it's so they can sell you their products. So we need to go back to nature and don't be gaslit by your doctor. I, there's a lot of gaslighting going on. They're like, oh, we must have misdiagnosed you. My business partner said the same thing. It's like, I cured my heartbeats and my ectopic heartbeats and my uh, psoriasis. And the doctor said, oh, we must have just misdiagnosed. I, yeah. I got it wrong. And that's insane. I've gotten gaslit at the doctor, too, when I said something was right. by the diet. And, I, and they're like, what right. do you— They make you feel thing. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to—look, you have to trust your gut. And, and our intuition, which we've kind of abandoned. You know, earlier indigenous communities rely on intuition— and we've abandoned our intuition because we think our pure intellect will solve everything. Sometimes your intuition is really good and it's better than your brain. And my intuition, wherever that came from, was the one that told me, don't listen to the doctors, try to heal yourself with food. And it worked. I love it. Back to human, back to nature. I think we should eat a grass-fed steak. Yeah, let's go eat a grass-fed steak. All right, Jason. Thanks, right. man. Thanks, Brian.